First of all, I start with a question for you. Are you tired of winning yet? No. We're still winning, folks. No matter what you're hearing on the news, we're still winning. Let me explain what's going on. First of all, winning Ron DeSantis and Casey DeSantis, the best looking governor and first lady I think the state of Florida has ever seen, won by a healthy margin. It's been trimmed to 30,000 votes. We'll talk about that recount in just a moment. But look it, you know, it was a tough battle. They called them Ron the Racist. They, they, they called them all kinds of names. They tried to accuse them of all kinds of nonsensical stuff, bigotry. And it's all crap and we know it. The voters didn't buy it. They elected Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis is going to be the 46th governor of the state of Florida. The, the, the margin of victory, even trimmed down to some 30,000 votes, is still above the quarter percent that would require a manual recount. So once they get to a deadline, we'll talk about that momentarily, once they get to a deadline for the actual certification, he's in. That's over with. Now, Rick Scott. Rick Scott had a margin of larger than Ron DeSantis's, but that got trimmed down by a remarkable amount when Broward uh, found uh, more Democratic ballots under every rock in Broward County, and um, and he's trimmed down to a little over 12,000 votes. Now, you may think that's gonna get overturned in a recount. No, it's gonna probably be determined, possibly, in the U.S. Supreme Court, because these Democrats are gonna litigate all the way up to there to try to get them to break Florida law by passing extension of deadlines through judges and uh, and breaking rules that are long established by law. It's not going to happen. Obstacle, Broward ballot fraud. Dr. Brenda Stipes is both incompetent and corrupt. And her methodologies, including counting ballots after the election polls have closed or accepting ballots in inappropriate ways or actually possibly moving ballots inappropriately, breaking the chain of custody. It's all been going on in Broward County. Palm Beach County has been denying access and transparency for people to see what's going on. Remarkably, Miami-Dade managed to, uh, to get it done, but uh, you know, it's not a helpful uh, venue there either. Governor Scott, after this happened, announced that night no ragtag group of liberal activists or lawyers from D.C. will be allowed to steal this election from the voters of the state of Florida. And he immediately filed a lawsuit. He went for impoundments. He didn't get that. Uh, you know, he filed lawsuits against Broward and Palm Beach County for ballot fraud. This is winding its way through the courts. We have a lot of liberal judges. The Democrats are shopping to liberal judges like the one in Leon County, which is Tallahassee, that uh, did some uh, rulings that are not favorable to us, giving Palm Beach County some deference to uh, extend their deadline five days. That won't fly in federal court, I don't think. Now, Pam Bondi steps in. She still is the chief law enforcement officer of the state of Florida. And she told the FDLE, Florida Department of Law Enforcement, uh, look, you're saying you don't see anything wrong here. Launch a criminal investigation. I'm ordering you. So they're doing that. I said, well, we didn't know that we did anything wrong. You know, why are you criticizing us? Well, because she knows they're, they're, they're just standing back and letting things happen. You can't do that. You have to be proactive. I don't know if any of you are aware of the fact, Tony uh, put it up on Facebook a couple of days ago, uh, that the RPO, not the RPO, but the uh, RNC. RNC had been under a, a consent decree that was signed in 1982. All these years, so 36 years, we've been under a consent decree um, that was renewed by this judge that was appointed, a federal judge that was appointed by Jimmy Carter, um, that prohibited the RNC from litigating, from investigating, from overseeing, from intervening in elections where they saw evidence of cro crooked activity in elections for some 36 years, 35 years anyway. And then the judge finally died. Another judge took it up. It was an Obama appointee, but he looked at it and he said, well, there's no evidence the Republicans have done anything wrong, so there's no reason for this to continue. So that consent decree is done, and we're no longer shackled by that federal court consent decree prevented from actually defending the integrity of our votes. So that's a good thing. The shackles are off the Republican Party. And so you can see evidence of that in the litigation. Another part of the winning edge started in January of this year, or not actually in December of last year, when uh, Ron DeSantis rode with President Trump in Air Force One. And you remember that famous tweet? 
that came out endorsing Ron DeSantis for governor. This was before Ron had officially announced for governor. And of course, at the time, Adam Putnam was the odds on favorite to become our next uh, Republican nominee. And uh, that didn't happen. So um, Ron DeSantis got a big boost from President Trump. So that's part of the winning edge. Another part of the winning edge. Ron secured the winning edge by tapping into Florida's vast reservoir of Trump deplorables. Have you been to a Trump rally? How many of you have been to a Trump rally? Well, quite a lot of you. Did you sense the energy there? It's like going to a rock concert. I mean, this, this man has an incredible um, uh, force of personality, but also there's a reason why Trump has such a bond with the people that come to these rallies. It's not because we know Trump has got a big ego. We know he talks a lot about himself and he boasts and he uses a lot of hyperbole. But the one most important thing people recognize in this president is that he has your interest at heart and your interest at heart and your interest at heart. He understands the plight of the working people. When he was a, a tycoon building in New York, he used to go down to those construction sites. He got to know the average working men and women that worked for him. He's always treated his people with great courtesy and respect. I can tell you an experience we had when we went to Trump International um, earlier this year for an event with Sarah Palin, and I was waiting with um, a couple of the, the uh, doormen there uh, to get a cab. And I was talking with them. One was from Ethiopia, another one from Eritrea. They were talking about how Mr. Trump treated them. They said he always stops and asks about my family, treats me with great respect. They give us full health coverage. They pay for everything. They treat us well. This is a side of Donald Trump that's never seen. This man, for all of the flaws that some people see in his, his brash behavior and his hitting back, is just the kind of adrenaline the Republican Party needed because the Democrats have been ruthless for a long, long time. We need somebody who's equal to the task. Donald Trump is equal to the task. Trump is the ultimate winning edge. Now, America's mayor, Rudy Giuliani, how many of you went to the rally at Republican headquarters in South Daytona? Uh, Tony estimates about eight, uh, 800 to 850 people were there. 250 crammed in the building, and we had a spill-out crowd. It was the biggest crowd in the state of Florida, other than Boca Raton, which had 1,000 later that day. For Rudy, uh, Pam Bondi, uh, Jeanette Nunez, uh, uh, Ron's uh, running mate, Casey, of course, was there. The hostile rogue media, believe it or not, gives Trump a winning edge. Jim Acosta. Does anyone feel sorry for Jim Acosta in this room? No. Now they're suing the president because they took away his press pass. Did you know that CNN has 50 people who have hard White House press passes, any one of which could go in and cover those events? He's not the only person working for CNN, but he misbehaved. He, you know, Democrats, if a Republican lays hand on a woman ever so gently, it's, it's a sexual assault. You know, this guy, this guy uh, pushed this intern back, took the microphone, hogged the thing, and he makes the agenda about himself. He's going to argue with the president. He's not going to ask the president a question and sit down and listen for the answer. He's going to debate the president. This does not help Jim Acosta or CNN. This helps President Trump because he's the first president that's not going to put up with it. Casey is the ultimate winning edge. Casey is a powerful ally. I think the best uh, political ad that was presented during the campaign was by Casey. She made the case for Ron. Now, I'm going to, there's a man sitting in the back of the room there in a red hat, always wears his MAGA hat, tireless Tony Ledbetter. Now, whether you love him or you hate him, you have to acknowledge he gets the job done. General Patton was not universally beloved either, but he won the battles. Tony knows how to do it. He knows how to put together the troops. He is the king of logistics for the Florida Republican Party. When they want 10,000 DeSantis signs delivered all over Florida, who do they turn to? Tony Ledbetter. The same thing for Donald Trump. We were, we were Republican moving and storage company during 2016. It was again during this campaign. This is a busy, busy place in Volusia County, and Tony's part of that. Now, another little aspect of this election that I think actually accrued to our benefit, thank God nobody got hurt when somebody fired, recklessly fired four bullet shots into the Republican headquarters in South Daytona. That drew us national attention. It was headlined in every major news uh, organization, the New York Times, Washington Post, you name any of them. We were headlines. Tony made the headlines. I have a great picture. 
The New York Times did a feature article on Election Day about the whole election across the country, and one picture was used. It was a picture of Tony Ledbetter peering out of the repaired window of Republican headquarters at the crowd of people waiting for Ron DeSantis. And uh, that tells you how important this county is, not just to Florida, but to the nation. We're a linchpin of Florida, which is actually a linchpin of the American battle for the, uh, the soul of America. I told the, the uh, editorial page editor of the uh, Union uh, Daytona Beach News Journal that, who called me to get some comment about this incident in the preparation of an editorial. And I said, one thing I'd like you to correct in your editorial is that newspapers referred to this act against us as an act of vandalism. I said, this was not an act of vandalism. This was an attempted murder of the American spirit. Somebody is trying to intimidate us. This was an act of terrorism. You know, this is not vandalism. Vandalism when you spray paint a, a wall. This is not vandalism. They fired five, four live bullets that hit into the walls inside our headquarters. One hit into the backdrop where our speakers speak. We're gonna keep those bullet holes as a source of pride. We're gonna remind everybody, and of course, when they asked Tony Ledbetter, you know, in his modicum of tact, he said, I blame the Democrats. Well, I, I can tell you this, Tony, put out some unassailable logic. He said, what Republican would do this to a Republican? What non-party affiliated person would do this to a Republican? So Tony had unassailable logic on that, even though it wasn't necessarily the most diplomatic thing to say after that. It sure got the attention of the newspapers. The GOP All-Stars, Pam Bondi, Jeanette Nunez, Rudy Giuliani, America's mayor, standing up for Ron DeSantis, and of course the picture in the New York Times. Then I have a picture of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of volunteers, including the women for DeSantis who wore the pink shirts, the women for DeSantis, worked tirelessly. Folks in your club worked. New Smyrna Beach worked. All these clubs worked together to make this happen. This is not one person's victory. This is a victory that belongs to all of us. The other thing that was a huge factor and has been a huge factor, you may remember four years ago, the newspaper was all over our case because we had these voter guides. These voter guides, which, you know, what the Democrats want to do is they want to hide the ball. They don't want you to know who the Republicans are running for local and county offices. Well, the voter guide tells them who's playing on what team. When you go to the supermarket, you don't buy all generic products, do you? You have certain brand names you trust. You've trusted for years because you know what to expect when you buy those products. Well, the same is true in politics. You need a party label to understand what brand you're buying. And so the voter guides are very important. Now they come to understand that they work. People then get those guides and understand how they, they want to vote in their best interest. Early voting, interesting statistics. Early voting statistics. We had, first of all, vote by mail ballots. 77,662 vote by mail ballots were submitted. 63,516 early voting ballots cast. I think that's an all-time record. A total of 141,178 ballots cast before election day. That represents 61.1% of the entire vote for this year. Think about that. That's almost two thirds. 141,178. 230,959 total ballots were cast, and that turnout was 60.4%, which is not as healthy as it could be, but it's still pretty, pretty good. Let's compare it from year to year. Okay, 60.4%, 230,000 ballots. Do you think that's um, better than the previous midterms in 2014? Yes. yes. Yeah. In 2014, we cast 178,442 ballots. That turnout was 53.97%. It's almost as good as 2016, believe it or not, where we cast 265,202 ballots, which is only 35,000 more than we did this year. A turnout then was 72.97%. Now, that's on a smaller universe, though, because we didn't have as many voters then as we do now. Here's a little bit of an interesting statistic I pulled together for you. Okay, in 2014, in Volusia County, we had 111,519 active Republican voters. This year, we have 135,674. We've increased 24,155 active Republican voters in four years. That's an increase of 21.7%, okay? Now, Democrats had 122,684 four years ago. Now they have 130,296. They've increased 7,612. 
So that's a 6.2%. So we have more than tripled the increase in voters of the Democrats. We had 21.7% increase, they had a 6.2% increase. Of course, the number, the universe of voters has gone up as well. Now, the other part of this winning edge is the fact that Governor Rick Scott ran Florida as a smart businessman would run a corporation. He cut our taxes, he cut regulations, he made uh, more efficiencies throughout the state. Our economy is booming. We have one of the best economies in the country. And of course, in a country which has perhaps the best economy it's had as long as we can remember, those two men. Disaster management, another part of Rick Scott's winning edge. We saw him in helicopters. We saw him on the ground with, uh, with the president. He was taking care of business from the very first day. And every time we've had one, have you ever seen any of these things happen without him right in the middle of it? Commanding all of the emergency forces to make sure everything is done. This man is on the spot doing the job. The other part, Rick Scott. Remember President Trump in Pensacola? He said, this guy, Rick Scott, uh, but Nelson, Nelson, uh, can somebody show me a picture of him? I've never seen the guy. <laughs> he said, in all the time I've been the president, I've never gotten a phone call from this guy. He's never knocked on my door. He's never come to visit me. He's never asked for a thing from me from Florida. Rick Scott won't leave me alone. He's on the phone every day. He's a damn nuisance. You want a guy like that standing up for you. Okay, another part of the winning edge, the Kavanaugh effect. You guys watch that circus, right? How many of you watch some of those hearings? Okay, and one of the most disgraceful uh, kangaroo courts I've ever seen in my life uh, with Spartacus and, and all the others. And, and they were trying to run for president off the platform, or basically off the platform of uh, Brett Kavanaugh's political carcass. Well, it didn't, ha it, didn't, uh, it didn't succeed. What happened differently with Donald Trump and with Brad Kavanaugh is both were tough enough to say, too bad, we're not giving up. We're not gonna give up. And in truth, when you're telling the truth, you don't have to worry about it, right? Uh, you know, Mark Twain once said years and years ago, you know, it's easier to tell the truth because then you don't need a good memory. <laughs> you know, because you don't have to figure out what story did I tell last that I have to stick to, right? Brett Kavanaugh's, and of course, since then, the Judiciary Committee has issued a 400-page report which completely discredited uh, all of these accusers and stood for Kavanaugh. Another big part of the, uh, the winning edge is Trump's big red wall. That's kind of a double entendre. Uh, the wall is an issue. The immigrant caravan that's coming forth, the invasion, that Jim Costa doesn't think is an invasion because it's hundreds of miles away. Um, you know, the, would we have said that about Hitler when it was 100 miles away? I mean, it's not an invasion yet. No, when they get here, it's an invasion. Well, the point is that wall is an issue. Immigration was an issue in this campaign. The Democrats tried to make it about health care, something which they screwed up themselves, creating an Obamacare system that has impossible deductibles, impossible premiums, all funneled by subsidies the government gives to the insurance agency, uh, insurance companies, so big insurance can jack up the premiums and take two thirds of it from the government. So there's no consequence for raising premiums. When you switch to free market, if that ever happens, then the premiums go down, the coverage is improved because they have to compete. President Trump is doing everything he can administratively to improve that. And taking away non uh, pre existing conditions is not one of the strategies. The other, the other part of the winning edge, it's obvious to all of us. I don't think you need a statistic to tell you that this economy is doing better than ever. We now, for the first time perhaps ever in our history, have what is referred to as full employment. We have more jobs available than we have people to fill the jobs. If anything, we need more training for these people to be able to take those jobs. You know, that's part of the winning edge for Donald Trump. Unemployment rate nationwide, 3.7%, GDP above 4%. What, remember what Obama said about uh, trying to get it above 2%? What's he gonna do? Wave a magic wand or something? Yeah, it's called common sense. You know, you just take the choke off of business, you let them do what they have to do. The trade war at first causes trepidations because some parts of our economy get uh, disadvantaged, but eventually we prevail. We prevail with Canada and Mexico, we're gonna prevail with China and everybody else with whom we're an adversary because the United States is too big to ignore. So, let's add up some of our wins here. No more Democrats, for the most part, in this county. Ron DeSantis is our next governor, take it to the bank. Rick Scott is our next U.S. Senator, take it to the bank. Mike Waltz is our next congressman, no, ch no need for a recount there. Tom Wright is our next Florida senator. Elizabeth Federhoff is our next Florida rep. Even with a recount, they don't think that's gonna change. 
Ron DeSantis, Governor DeSantis, will protect Rick Scott's red-hot Florida economy. No question about it. Here's the most important thing about electing this Republican governor. Governor Ron DeSantis will appoint three new conservative Florida Supreme Court judges. You know what that means? Instead of a four to three liberal split, there'll be a six to one conservative on the court, which means they can no longer undo the will of the state legislature at, at willy-nilly. The conservative DeSantis Florida Supreme Court will last for decades. On election night at Stonewood Grill, we had three Republicans who ran against each other for Congress. Fred, Fred Costello, John Ward, and Mike Waltz stood toe to toe. I took their picture together. They're on the same side because we have to do that as Republicans. We had to reunite. Let's take a look at what happened in the congressional seats in Florida for a second. We held this seat. We proved this seat is a red seat. You know, Democrats need not apply. Mike Waltz won by a healthy 42,000 vote margin in this district. No problem. We did lose two seats in Florida. We lost Florida's 26th congressional district. Debbie Muscarell Powell beat Carlos Cabello in Florida's 26th. That's in South Florida. Also in South Florida, uh, Donna Shalala, who used to be Bill Clinton's uh, cabinet officer, I think she was labor secretary, if I recall correctly, beat uh, Maria Elvira Salazar in a race that was reasonably close, 15,000 votes, but that was a heavy Democrat uh, place. So we have a split now. We've got the Senate held, in the House, the so-called blue wave. It's not really a blue wave. I've got a big picture of Nancy here in front of me with a gavel in her hand. She's gonna have the gavel. But what is the latest to read on the House? The Democrats needed 218 seats to take the majority. As at the, today's reckoning, and the last one I checked, was it uh, they're at 228 seats. That's 10 above the mark, okay? They, they got a margin of 10 votes. That's a very slim margin. Keep in mind, when you've got all these people running back and forth doing different things, there's gonna be a little split here or there. They're not gonna get everything done that they want. First of all, I'll predict this to you. They're not gonna get anything accomplished in the next two years, nothing. The only thing they're gonna get accomplished is slapping President Trump and his people around and getting the voters madder and madder and madder. And ultimately, Trump is gonna make an end run around them politically and get some things accomplished in spite of them. Uh, it's not the, the worst thing that could happen. There's something in politics called the boomerang factor. A Newton's law had it. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction, you're gonna see that boomerang, or if you will, pendulum factor flow back to us in 2020, because you know this president is not gonna sit back and let this happen. Okay, but let's look at the Senate, some encouragement here. Yes, we lost Nevada and Arizona. Arizona was a strange one, uh, but we lost two, okay? But we gained four, so our net gain is two seats. Instead of 51, votes in the Senate, we will now have 53 votes, including our former governor, Rick Scott. So it's gonna be easier for President Trump to push through judicial nominations and other cabinet officer nominations. It's gonna be a lot easier. So uh, in governor's races, the Democrats appear to have picked up seven uh, governorships. Uh, we have lost six, but we still are in the majority. We have 26 states, they have 23 among the governors. Now, the amendments, on the Florida ballot, uh, we had um, a number of amendments, only one of them failed. And that was the one that called for an additional $25,000 property tax assessment uh, 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 exemption. Um, and the argument that local governments made about that is it was gonna cost out of their budgets. You know what they were, they were gonna likely do if that exemption took place. They just raised the military. And so you, didn't, you wouldn't have gotten the advantage of it anyway. It was rejected by the voters. It, it made 58% statewide, I believe, and needs 60% to pass. The, the amendments that did pass, some of them are kind of troublesome. Uh, amendment two is good. 10% cap on non-homestead property taxes passed. Amendment three, voter approval of casino gambling passed. That, that means it's the voters that have to approve it now, uh, not the, the state legislature or the voters. Uh, restoring felon voting rights to nonviolent offenders, that passed. Um, that's problematical. Super majority required for tax and fee hikes passed, which I think most people would agree. And Crime Victims Bill of Rights, uh, there are good aspects to that, but it was bundled with some other provisions that uh, are, they have, you know, like omnibus bills, they throw things in there unrelated. Number seven, benefits for families of first responders and vets passed. Number nine, ban on offshore drilling, ban on indoor vaping. They tied those two together. Uh, number 10, was controversial here, that was Sheriff Chipwood's big uh, push to make uh, uh, the sheriff 
the assessor, the tax collector, and the supervisor of elections, constitutional officers. Now, back in 1970, voters here voted with home rule measure to create a charter that made them nonpartisan, thus being able to hide the ball on which party the people running for those offices appeared to be. So they couldn't say they were Republican or Democrat. The plus part of this is that it's gonna allow us to know who the Republicans and Democrats are working, running for these offices starting in 2020. Now, the, the negative side is it's gonna cost a little bit of money to change over these offices to constitutional authorities. Now, let me ask this question. Uh, some people object to this based on home rule. How many of you were here in 1970 when you might have been able to vote for that? Anybody raise a show of hands? One, two. How many of you were, oh, three. How many, how many of you were not here? Okay, so how were you disenfranchised? I think that you got a chance to vote this time. So uh, that's my argument. And uh, my experience is uh, in the history of the office of sheriff, since the time of medieval England, the sheriff was always the law enforcement office. I had a conversation with Jim Deneen a couple of years ago when he bragged to me he was the hired county manager until he wasn't anymore. Um, he wasn't elected by anybody, he was hired. He bragged to me that he ran the sheriff's department, not Ben Johnson because he said he can't hire, he can't fire, he can't promote, he can't demote, he can't issue raises, he can't do a budget without my permission. I thought, that's pretty arrogant. Who elected you? Well, now you'll be able to elect a sheriff based on him being the chief law enforcement officer of the county. So, all in all, there are two sides to that argument. Amendment 11, property transactions by non-citizens passed, 12, lobbying ban for public officials passed, and the ban on greyhound racing passed, which uh, may have unintended consequences because of loose language. It might eventually apply to horse racing and all kinds of other things, so watch out, folks. Now, the GOP found the, war, the right stuff to fulfill the Dorothy Huckel legacy. Uh, Tom Wright won that seat on Dorothy's name on the ballot. The Florida House District 6, 26, now better off with Heather, better off. Now, there's a 59 vote margin right now for her. It doesn't appear that's going to change. But, you know, they're going through the rehab count process starting tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock um, to check that. I mean, that's going to be a hand recount of about 1,500 of the ballots that were overvoted or undervoted, just to make sure everything's correct. But the machine tally has not changed at all. Machine tally very rarely does, because machines are very arbitrary. So uh, it's, it's where you interpret those overvotes where somebody marked twice on the ballot or they failed to fill in the vote in that race to determine what the intent of the voter was. All red Republican Volusia delegation, for the first time perhaps in the, since Reconstruction maybe, we have no Democrats representing us in the state legislature. How's that? Yeah. You're gonna have Federhoff, Santiago, Renner, and Leak representing you, and Wright, in the state Senate. Um, so President Trump, making America proud again, promises made, promises kept, buying American, hiring American, making America safe again, you know, the rush and the deplorables gave Trump the winning edge on the night before the election. How many of you saw that rally in Missouri, in Rush's hometown, Cape Girardeau, Missouri? Huge show. Rush gets on, does a great speech for, uh, for President Trump. Then Sean Hannity gets on. Well, the Lee Greenwood plays the president onto the stage. And, uh, and Judge Janine comes out and gives a little speech for him. The crowd was incredible. He closed the deal with America that night. You know, and historically, presidents do not hold on in midterms, they usually lose big in the House and they lose the Senate too. This president held the Senate, expanded the Senate, and minimized the losses in the House. In spite of a lot of the uh, Republicans that lost, many of them were keeping a distance from Trump, I think, to their disadvantage. You have to, you have to understand that Donald Trump is the leader of our party and we have to unite under his banner because what happens next is going to be ominous. We have now an election where Democrats will spend the entire next two years running subpoenas to the White House and calling people down to Capitol Hill to testify. Whitaker is the first target. They wanted to recuse himself. No basis for doing that. He had no conflict of interest whatsoever. His commentary when he was a private citizen about what might or might not happen with Mueller has nothing to do with him doing the job. Number two, they claimed he was illegally appointed because he's never been confirmed for any other office. The law that was passed by Congress, the Vacancy Act some 20 years ago, provides that it can either be a confirmed person or a senior official of that department who has served in that capacity. Well, he meets that obligation. He served it for more than three months. He meets the threshold. 
the uh, Office of Legal Counsel of the Department of Justice just issued a, a, a multi-page report on that today saying his appointment is perfectly legal. So put that away. He's the AG. He also knows where all the bodies are buried, and he's not, he's not, he's not handcuffed the way Jeff Sessions was. So stay tuned. Might be some interesting grand jury uh, action coming. The plot thickens. And then we're going to deal with the angry bunch. Nancy Pelosi, Elijah Cummings as the head of oversight, Gerald Nadler as the head of judiciary, Chuck Schumer, I call him Chuck Schemer, and you got uh, Shipless Schiff, who's going to be the head of, um, oh God, which, the, which committee is he? Intelligence. Intelligence. Yeah, that's, that's an oxymoron, right? Okay. You got Steny Hoyer, and you got Mad Maxine Waters, the head of financial services. She's going to be overseeing your banks and your insurance companies. And Eric Swalwell, the master of uh, the master of deception from California. That's what we have coming, folks. That what that's what makes it so very much important for us to realize that uh, our work has just begun. This election is almost over. Once the judges get done, then it'll be over. But once that's over, we have to start over again because we have to work every day and every night to make sure that we destroy the Democrat myth machine and we re-elect Donald Trump to continue this legacy for our children and our grandchildren. So are you with me? Are we going to keep America great? Well, thanks. The slideshow will be applied to the video from this on Facebook later. So thanks, folks, for having me.